All right. Hello, everyone. We really appreciate you joining us today. If I could just ask as we're um, approaching our start time, if you have a second, if you can, if you're on Zoom, if you can um, go into the chat feature and maybe just tell us where you're calling in from today. That would be very interesting to us. Um, the Q&A box, we're going to reserve that for questions to be submitted. I'll go into that a little bit in a minute or two. Um, but submit any questions in the Q&A feature and then uh, maybe let us know where you're coming from as far as location goes in the chat. That would be just great. We really appreciate that. And um, again, I want to welcome everybody for taking the time to join this, um, what, what promises to be a very informative session today. And the session will kind of take three parts. We'll do some quick introductions, which we're doing right now. Um, and then we'll get into the, the heart of the presentation and hear from our featured speaker today. And uh, really looking forward to that information. And then the final part um, of the session will be the, the questions and answers. And so um, we'll address as many questions as we can today. And I'll get into a few more specifics on that in just a moment. But um, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Greg Rivoli, and I serve on the board of the Gray Muzzle Organization. And I think um, many of you, or some of you at least, are familiar with Gray Muzzle. But um, I wanted to make sure that I gave a little bit about a little bit of background about our organization because I'm really proud to um, be part of it. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. We're a 501c3 and we were founded in 2008. So we're about 13 years old. And our vision is to help create a world where every senior dog thrives and no old dog dies alone or afraid. And our mission is to improve the lives of at-risk senior dogs by providing funding and resources to animal shelters, rescue organizations, sanctuaries, and other nonprofit groups nationwide. And our funding, if, to, to, to get just a little bit more specific, our funding supports medical and dental programs to help senior dogs get adopted. Sometimes that's a real issue and stands in the way of adoption. We fund retention, meaning keeping dogs in the homes that they already have by assisting them with medical care um, and or food. We also have a Seniors for Seniors program where we match senior citizens with senior dogs. We offer funding for hospice and long-term foster care, orthopedic beds for senior shelter dogs, and lastly, innovative other innovative ways to help senior dogs live their absolute best lives. And we're really proud of the mission and the vision here. And since our founding in 2008, Gray Muzzle has granted nearly $4 million to shelters and rescues in the US, Canada, and Puerto Rico. And during our last year's grant cycle in 2022, Gray Muzzle awarded $705,000 in grants to 78 different organizations, helping an estimated 3,300 vulnerable senior dogs in need. So if you're passionate and a, just a passionate dog lover like I am, especially the senior dogs, you can understand why after I retired from the corporate rat race in the financial sector, I became a board member at Gray Muzzle and an active volunteer at Gray Muzzle. And since I've joined Gray Muzzle um, nearly two years ago, um, it's been truly a blessing for me to be able to help these wonderful dogs. And my passion for seniors is also rooted in my two senior Cotan du Tuliers, not sure if you've heard of that breed. It's, it's unique, but kind of like a Bijan or a Havanese. And um, my beloved Kiwi, she passed away. We lost her at 15 years old. So she was a super senior and we lost her to lymphoma. And my boy Kona is nearly 20 years old, if you can believe that. And he is still healthy, happy, and he gives my wife and I great joy every single day. So with that as background, I would like to introduce today's topic and speaker. Today's topic is calming your aging dog using touch and other methods, which will be presented by Lori Stevens. And I wanna give you just a little bit about Lori. She's a professional dog trainer, an animal behavior consultant, a canine fitness trainer, 
and an animal massage practitioner, Lori continually studies the interactions among animal behavior, movement, learning, fitness, and health. She uses intimidation-free scientific and innovative methods in an educational environment to improve the behavior, performance, health, and fitness of animals. Lori gives workshops, presents at conferences, teaches online courses, and gives webinars. So I will turn it over to Lori in just a moment, but before we do that, talking about the um, question and answers, I just wanted to uh, give you just a little bit on that. Um, so again, if you're on Zoom, use the Q&A function for um, Zoom, and uh, we will address the questions at the end of the session. And Lori has requested that we um, be as specific as possible with your questions, and um, she's not in a position to take medical questions. So um, hold off on your medical questions and just be as specific as possible with your um, non-medical questions. And uh, we will field those at the end of the end of today's session. If time doesn't permit, um, because we have a lot of participants today and we'll probably get a lot of questions, um, then we will try to address those after the fact and um, after the session ends. And you can, um, or after the session, you may say, gosh, I, I wish I would have asked that question. I completely forgot. Um, you can do that. You can contact us at www gray muzzle gray is with an e dot org forward slash contact hyphen us so one more time www.graymuzzle.org forward slash contact us and we will follow up with you promptly i promise so with that Lori, i would like to turn it over to you thank you can you hear me okay hear you great that's great um i'm going to put up my first slide and then I'm just going to say a little bit uh, about myself and gray muzzles. So um, I recognize some names actually that are in this uh, webinar. So hi to everyone that nice to meet the ones I don't know and the ones I know, hello. Um, so way back when, <laughs> a long time ago, because I'm kind of old, um, I, I had a veterinarian who said, if you would just make business cards, I would send you all my old dogs, all the aging. And so I did. And that's how I started in uh, a dog practice. Now I work with more than just dogs and it's many years later, but uh, that's where it all started. And I, I don't know how to explain how much aging dogs mean to me. Uh, but they do, they mean a lot. And it was so fascinating listening to Greg introduce the organization because he said something about, and I don't know the words exactly that he said, but something about making sure our senior dogs thrive for, throughout their whole lives. And helping dogs thrive has been my tagline for I don't know how long. And that really applies to, um, to senior dogs because I've seen dogs many senior dogs go from <clears throat> sleeping most of the day and not being very active to um, regaining function and being very active again and being able to go upstairs again and that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's natural, I think, that we um, may have more than one dog and we see our aging dogs tend to sleep a lot and we're like, well, they need to sleep and I don't wanna bother them. But actually, <laughs> if we do bother them or get them up to do more, they will do more and they will enjoy doing more and they be can, can become more engaged and stronger and regain function. And it's a beautiful thing to watch. Um, today, I'm not covering uh, the physical side in terms of um, regaining strength. I do that in plenty of other forums. Um, but today, I'm covering primarily touch body work, uh, T touch and massage. I'll have a little section on um, harness fit and a section on slow movement and the advantage of that. Um, but uh, I haven't actually taught this topic in a while and I'm kind of excited about it. And you could just as easily call this, um, call this webinar comforting your aging dog using touch and medicine. 
things. So um, calming, comforting, wh whichever you want or need. Um, but today is mostly about um, body work, which is massage and tea touch. Um, if you're me, that's what I call it. And uh, let me just tell you that my philosophy is um, that we don't force a dog to do any work, really. We provide them the choice to participate or not. And it's a question of how well we listen to our dogs. Have we fine-tuned that ability to recognize when they'd really rather not participate? Um, I'm a big believer in reinforcing desired behaviors or you know, giving a treat or uh, interacting in some way, including hopefully touch will be a reinforcer for your dog. Um, after you practice after today and setting up the environment for success for anything we're doing with our senior dogs or our dogs period. Um, so your dog really should enjoy touch and enjoy slow movement. So um, we want to get their say and their active participation from the very beginning and we want to encourage our dogs to interact and um, I'll show you an example of um, what no looks like. Um, the, in, in terms of body language, in a way we all have to be experts in body language. We may be working with an animal that we haven't had very long. We might have a, an aging dog that, um, we have a local organization here in Seattle called um, Old Dog Haven. And so a lot of people end up adopting older dogs that may not be comfortable with touch. They may not have trust built up with them yet. Um, but this is very much something, if the dog comes to you and doesn't have communication skills, it's extremely possible and essential that we build those communication skills and therefore we're building trust. And it's a, that's a, to me a very key component of, of every relationship. And of course, reinforcing positive interactions and, and communication is extremely important. So how do we know when our dog may not be comfortable with um, what we're doing with them or asking them to participate in? They could yawn, they could um, flick their tongue. You might see just a really fast tongue flick out of their mouth. They might turn their head away, if, especially if we get in their face. <laughs> Uh, they might get up and move away. Uh, tail position might be tucked. They might be rounded in the back or roached in the back. Here's what roached looks like. This is my goat that I'll be uh, doing a little bit with today, perhaps. Um, ear position, normally if the ears are, depending on what kind of ear they have, but um, if it's a flap, <laughs> it might look different than if it's a folded ear versus an erect ear. But generally, if it's towards you, they're engaging. And if it's um, away from you or planted at the back of their head, they're not so comfortable. Unless you're behind them, then their ear might be back to listen to what you're doing next. Um, so it all is like within context. Uh, they might be breathing rapidly. They might have really wide eyes. They may be really still. And they might appear a little bit stiff or not breathing. Um, and that's a sign to move away. <laughs> move yourself away. Step away from the dog. Okay. Uh, so in ob observing our aging dogs, um, like I said, it's important we understand the stress signals. Um, I, I like to think of observation as using all of our senses other than taste. <laughs> so we don't need to taste our aging dogs. But we can feel with our hands, are their bodies really hot? Are they cold? Is the front half of their body one temperature and the back half another? Do their eyes look healthy? Is there a lot of goop in the corner of their eyes? Do their, is their nose running a lot? Um, are the inside of their ears clean? Do they, um, how do they smell? Um, what does their coat look like? Are parts of their coat sticking up and other parts lying flat? Um, what does their posture look like? What does the gait look like? Do they vocalize a lot? And have you figured out what that vocalization means? Um, are they eating well? And by the way, with aging dogs, of course, it's important to learn how to reinforce eating. Eating is a behavior. 
Um, have they changed their behavior recently? So um, all these things, you know, we can look for um, all the time. And I think it's a wonderful thing to write down what you're seeing today. What, what things do you see today? So in one month, you can uh, look back or you can go, I don't think I've seen that before and look back to your notes. I think it's important to keep a log of what you see with your dogs and be your dog's advocate. Oh man, this is such a big one. And it's so hard to do. Um, it's not hard to do unless you're, you know, at a vet appointment, for example, I, I have the utmost respect for vets. I love vets, but sometimes, you know, we tend to, um, not be there to advocate for them. And for one reason or another, the pandemic has not helped with that. And things may not go um, as we'd hoped. And, um, and then on the other hand, maybe they do go as hoped. But these days, veter veterinary clinics are super busy. I don't know what happened during the pandemic, but um, things have changed. And so it's important that in all scenarios, you try as hard as you can to be your dog's advocate. I just had a really bad experience, which I will not describe, but um, just know that I feel important about your dog being your dog's advocate in all situations. And that even though I say that over and over, I missed the opportunity to be my dog's advocate recently. And so it happens to all of us. Um, okay, so I think it's a wonderful thing to train at least some foundation behaviors with your aging dog if they're new to you. If they aren't new to you, chances are you already have. But um, in, in working with a dog that you're trying to build trust with, um, I think training or teaching a dog some behavior and reinforcing as you go along, reinforcing that behavior is part of building that trust. And trust is required for handling or body work. Some professionals have more time than others to build trust. Um, so you'd like to see uh, trust built with everyone who interacts with your dog. It's not always gonna be the same amount of time to build that trust, especially in busy veterinary um, situations. Um, teaching your aging dog, it is never too late to teach them cooperative husbandry. I um, I remember I was seeing a very fearful dog that was in foster care of um, a client and she kept talking about her older dog and how her older dog bit her all the time. And, you know, she was having so much trouble <laughs> with that dog. And finally I said, can you bring that dog in? And the first time that little dog, the first thing that little dog did with me upon meeting, first thing jumped up and bit my elbow. And um, I immediately got out my clicker and some treats and started training that dog and um, Patty. And uh, she responded beautifully. She was just like dying to use her brain and dying for something to do. And they ended up instead of um, forcing Patty through all her things like nail clippings and baths and that sort of thing, they ended up teaching that dog at age 10 or 11, cooperative husbandry. And I have a video I'm not showing today, but it's beautiful to watch them interacting and seeing that, you know, that we can do that at any age and what a difference it makes in a relationship and trust. So just wanted to share that quick story with you. So this is one of my co-teachers. This is Cassie. Cassie died um, two years ago this April. She lived with me from age 18 months until 16, almost 16, a couple months shy of 16. Um, she's still my co-teacher. She's in pretty much every class I teach. Um, I now have uh, a little 20 month old whippersnapper, never mind another story. But anyway, <laughs> much harder than Cassie was. Okay, so I'm going to show you this video and I'm going to show you what not now, no thank you looks like uh, to Cassie. You may not hear um, so well the dialogue on this and I'll just tell you what I said at the end. It's not important. Basically, I want you to watch Cassie's body language. I'm going to show you abalone touch. 
An abalone touch with a lift on Cassie. Or not. So basically I said, <laughs> basically I said, I'm going, I'm, I was getting ready to do a, a six week course on massage and tea touch and I, I'm in a hotel room <laughs> with Cassie and, you know, I'm filming these particular uh, techniques of massage. And so I'm like, now I'm getting ready to show you this one. And she got up and walked off. So that was a, no, you're not right now. Thank you. Um, anyway, so that's what no can look like. Okay, so I like teaching foundation behaviors to, um, to every dog that I work with. So I just thought I would throw in what the foundation behaviors are that I view are important. They're, I could make a really long list, but these are at a minimum. Um, one is the mat. Where's your mat? And go to the mat and lie down. And treat delivery would be calmly to mouth or floor near their mouth. I like teaching all sorts of targeting, targeting with nose to the hand so that um, so that I can provide a uh, visual for that later. And I can always get my senior dog to come to me by holding out my touch cue, whatever that is. Right now with my young dog, it's two fingers. Um, with Cassie, it was a hand held flat like that. And she would come to that if she could see it. She eventually lost her hearing. And eventually uh, didn't see as well, but always saw well enough to see my hand. Um, I also teach a chin rest, which looks like this, which is really nice for cooperative care, not holding the muzzle, just a chin in the hand. And paw targeting the hand, which is I hold out my hand some way and ask for uh, one of four paws. And those are the foundation um, behaviors that I would teach any dog or teach a dog first, I should say. Recall, of course, is important. There's all sorts of important <laughs> behaviors. So not meaning to um, diminish any others, but these are a starting point because they're easy to teach. And uh, you can do a lot of husbandry and build a lot of trust around these behaviors. So unsure dogs, uh, what techniques do we use? Like, let's just say we've just um, adopted a, uh, I'm just going to see if I can move this over. Um, we've adopted a senior dog and they're not real sure about us touching them, yet we want to use these techniques. So um, the first thing we have to do is figure out what's reinforcing to them, because just because you know, one dog likes cheese better than anything in the world. The other dog might like chicken better than anything in the world or beef or whatever. So you've got to figure out, first of all, what your dog finds reinforcing and then figure out what's reinforcing and has high value versus low value. Um, <laughs> the reason I say that is because I've had a lot of dogs. I have, oh my gosh, I've worked with so many dogs. And uh, I'm not to call out breeds, <laughs> but there have been a few labs in that um, in that set of dogs, more than a few. And you know they're just hungry. So um, if something's too high value, you get you know I'm so excited, I'm so excited, I'm so excited, I can't even think, and I don't know what you want, but just give me that food. Whereas um, if something's low value, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that. And then you'll give me the reinforcement. So, um, so it is important to kind of know your level of reinforcer. And you can, um, one of the big things about working with an unsure dog is relieving pressure because if they are unsure and we haven't built up trust yet, our, our body next to them, asking them to move into our space or moving into their space, we can uh, toss a treat and relieve pressure from being too close to us by tossing a piece of food. Is there anything wrong with that? No, it actually builds trust and makes them want to come towards us more. So when we are tossing food, we are doing it in response to 
them looking at us or moving towards us and then we can mark it with good and then toss a treat. Um, you can kneel on the floor if, sa if safe or you can sit on a short stool to work with the dog so that you're, you're not moving around and not towering over them. Um, I think it's good to keep a fearful dog moving and letting them know they always have an escape route. Working with them in corners or in small spaces uh, is not a good idea. Um, we want them to feel as safe as possible and that's why <laughs> we want them to always have the option of moving away. And I am gonna be teaching some body work today and I want you to know that approaching with your hand low or the back of your hand is a lot less threatening at first than approaching with your hand on top of, of a goat or dog. <laughs> So, um, so using the back of your hand to come towards a dog is much less threatening, can be much less threatening. Um, I do like the dog appro to approach me rather than me approaching the dog. Uh, with fearful dogs, I avoid direct eye contact and I never, ever, ever would ask them to be comfortable in their own bed and then I would go up to them in their own bed. I will always set up a mat in a different environment, um, like a living room or something to show them that this is a different situation than you going to your bed. Um, and uh, if they are fearful, I use reinforcement for any interaction with me. And by the way, um, I think when you audibly exhale, it helps relax you and it helps relax the dog. So right before you do any body work can be a really nice intro to I'm about to touch you and it's okay. I mean, I, I can remember being on the back of a horse that hesitated right before um, we were gonna go over a jump and I audibly exhaled and the, and the horse seemed to just relax and go over the jump. So um, it's kind of amazing what, uh, breathing does for in terms of um, communication between you and your animal learner. And then where to touch first on um, a dog. I think this is a, a safer area in general to it all. Every dog is an individual, but in general, touching the shoulder first is less threatening than going straight to the hind end or the paw or the top of the head for sure. So Back of the hand to the shoulder is a nice non-threatening way of um, approaching the dog. Um, I like to, if it's a dog I'm not familiar with and I'm building trust with, I would do one stroke on the shoulder and remove my hand to see um, what the dog's reaction is. Do they move into me? Do they walk away? What do they do? Then I try another. Um, uh, the, I always uh, would use reinforcement or, or in this case, a treat. I would always, always use it after something, okay? I'm going to mark and reinforce some behavior. So either looking at me, look, uh, approaching me, I do uh, an initial, I'm just initially building trust. So one stroke on the shoulder, um, anything I'm going to, um, I'm going to use that treat for after. I'm not going to lure for body work. And in general, the body work I'm getting ready to teach you, I'm not going to use treats for. This is just in setting up the initial um, interaction with a dog that's not sure of me. So the dog decides when and how much touch is going to happen always. And initially, we're just building that trust by reinforcing the behaviors we want to see and helping build trust with that dog. Um, so we're not going to give a treat and follow it with grabbing or touching a dog for the first time. We do want to give reinforcement for um, the dog looking at us, coming near us, stroking the, us stroking the dog and the dog staying with us or the dog interacting with us. And hopefully, um, if you've done um, your preamble in a way that makes the dog totally comfortable with touch, touch can actually be a wonderful reinforcer. And uh, there you go. I mean, 
there's no reason to have treats in a body work session. As a matter of fact, they tend to amp up the dog too much. So we don't in general, in general do that. But having touch be a reinforcer is kind of a great thing. Um, so with T-touch or massage, and both of those I call body work. So when I say body work throughout this webinar, I'm talking about touch work, touch with my hands, um, tech, massage techniques or T-touch techniques with my hands. Um, when we're doing this work, this is not work we do uh, while we're chatting on the phone. This is, I very, very much think it's important to be present and to use our intent when we're touching a dog and to breathe. <sighs> Make certain you have a willing participant, that the environment is set up for comfort and there are no distractions. And, and eventually setting up um, no distractions like dogs barking or lots of a TV blaring and lots of people in the room. You really want a quieter environment for this work, especially at first. Um, and eventually that um, mat you place in a particular area where you plan to do body work with your dog can become a cue that you're getting ready to start body work and they come running. Um, another thing I wanna stress to you before uh, we get into any technique is I want to say that it's important you, you are comfortable as well. And so if you can find a way to um, get comfortable yourself, whether it's uh, having your dog on an ottoman, a soft ottoman with a mat on it and you on a stool or on a sofa in front of them or on a massage table. I have a massage table and I have a stool that goes at various, various heights. Um, not everybody can have a massage table, but finding a way for you to be comfortable as well is very important. You'll do the body work more if you're comfortable. This is from a book by Sue Furman on um, massaging animals. But this is, um, these stats are from a square inch of human skin. And, um, and I think depending on where you are on the body, the stats would be different. But, you know, skin is the lar largest organ in the body. Its primary job is to protect what's inside the skin. And there's a lot going on. And so when you are touching skin, you are affecting sensory receptors. You're touching nerves and nerve endings, therefore nerves, the nervous system, four feet of blood vessels. <laughs> it's unbelievable. In a square inch of skin, is that even possible? I think um, sweat glands are less likely to be as much in, um, in a dog's skin as uh, a human skin, so it didn't put a number, and at least a million cells. So, you know, whether these numbers are totally accurate or not, I have done, a, I did a little uh, searching um, to, and I did figure out that these numbers vary across the body, but just the fact that any part of the body could have these kind of numbers is astounding and really shows you how important the skin organ is. Jesse and I have just so um, I'm going to show you um, another video that tells me that um, Cassie is not so ready for touch. And the thing about this one is it's a lot more subtle than the last one I showed you. So I'm hoping to get this across that. Just because we're ready to do um, a session of body work doesn't mean our animals are ready to do it. And so I'm going to play this now. Oops, or not. Cassie and I have just done a bit of training and I'm inviting her to do a little bit of touch. I've just done a circular touch on the top of her head and now I'm going to do a circular touch on her shoulder. Then stroking down her body a bit. Now stroke her ear. And this is something that normally makes her want to relax. She's trying to, but I just don't think she's in the mood for touch. You can see she kind of isn't totally comfortable. She sits back up. I use the back of my hand to invite a little bit more. She engages. And then I give her another circular touch on the shoulder. 
isolated. And that's all for now. Thanks, Tess. So uh, I don't know if you could hear me, and it's okay if you didn't. But um, what I'm showing you there is that I know that dog. And Cassie did not lie her head down and relax saying, give me body work. I engaged her. She engaged back. She responded. I think she was like 50% 50, 50 into it. <laughs> but she wasn't into it enough to keep going, so I stopped. So I just wanted you to see how Eh, I don't really feel like doing it now. I don't really feel like getting body work now. What that looks like and that and that I stopped. So it doesn't always look like I'm getting up and walking away. So <clears throat> the benefits why this is the benefits. The benefits of body work are that it affects the nervous system. You can actually calm the nervous system or um, wake it up. So in general, so you know, slow touch calms the nervous system and fast touch wakes it up. So if you're trying to wake up your aging dog, you can do uh, some fast work. It calms and releases tension in the body, in the muscles, in the fascia. Slows breathing. Um, Many dogs with body work are able to accept touch in areas of their body that were previously sensitive. It gives us tool to influence our dog. Um, it, I mean, it's a great thing uh, to do body work with our older dogs due to arthritis. Um, I mean, it just, it, you can see the difference in our dogs after getting body work and how, how much easier it is for them to move once they've had a, a good body work session. Um, it affects us in a positive way. We feel better and uh, everybody feels calmer. Um, like I said, I like for us to be mindful and use our intention. Um, another thing is uh, we want to try and keep our wrist in neutral. So instead of your wrist being like this, just do this actually. Um, extend your wrist like this and move your fingers and then have your wrist in neutral, move your fingers and you feel how much more relaxed your fingers feel in, when your wrist is in neutral versus flexed or extended. So that's one important thing. Another important thing um, that I didn't write here, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. And that is that if you can ground um, your dog with them touching your knee or your other hand, just at least touching some part of their body while you're doing body work with your other hand. Um, it feels a lot different than if you're just using one hand. But I'll tell you that every once in a while, there's a dog that won't let you put two hands on them. It's too much. And so you do need to just use one hand. But in general, um, two hands or uh, a knee or a leg or a foot plus another hand is, is a, feels different. And if you want to know what that difference feels like, next time you're with a friend or your partner, um, you can put your uh, one hand on their shoulder and stroke down their back and then take that hand away and stroke down their back and ask them to explain the difference and how that felt. Or the other way, stroke down their back and then put your hand on their shoulder and stroke down their back. If you go ever go get body work yourself, you'll notice that your practitioner always has two hands on you. Um, calming work is done slowly. Um, pressure is light for the most part, but not too light. So there's this concept of tickly, which just makes you want to get away. Okay, it's just too light. And then there's pushing hard. And then there's um, kind of using the weight of your hand to kind of melt into the body and then doing uh, work from there with relaxed fingers, neutral wrist, breathing, all that stuff. <laughs> and observing body language at the same time. Um, so finding that pressure, which is just right and not too light and not too hard uh, is important to 
figure out. So um, I, I started in my education in animals with um, T-Touch certification many years ago and later did a massage certification. And uh, I found out, I figured out that some of it is exactly the same. It's just got different names. In massage, it's called effleurage. And in T-Touch, it's called Noah's March because they name everything after animals. Call it whatever you want. Call it a stroking touch. Um, and that's what it is. It's a stroking touch, which means you're stroking versus doing something else, <laughs> which I'll get into later. Um, so in general, what you would do is start at the dog's neck and stroke down the body. Now, um, what, what I prefer to do and what I think feels better, and this is how it's taught in T-Touch, is to stroke down all the way down the body, um, off the tail or you know whatever part you're stroking to stroke all the way off. And then to move your hand to another part of the body. So you can come back to this one area, but changing where you're stroking with every stroke feels really, really good um, and really relaxes the dog. You, if, you stroking, if you're stroking the tail, you stroke the entire tail all the way off the end. And, and this is what I meant by moving along the dog's body with each stroke, really moving along the body like this, but also moving along the body, your next stroke being in another area of the body versus going like this, stroke, 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 um, which sort of feels repetitive and doesn't feel as good to the nervous system or to the body. So I'm gonna play this video and this is effleurage. Oh, wait, I wanna say something here. <laughs> Uh, I had start I had just started to show this, and Cassie started chewing something, you know, chewing herself something itch, and I just let her continue. I wanted to show on video that you know it's life, um, and then how that changes. Okay. She looks at the camera. Was somebody watching? There are no words in this video. So I've got my hands off just waiting. Fidgety, she's very fidgety. <laughs> so that's what a fidgety session looks like. <laughs> she wasn't saying no, she just wasn't totally relaxed. She was a little itchy. Okay, and in that, that was more massage than T-touch. If it had been more T-touch, I would have gone off the dog. Um, that was showing effleurage massage, which you can stroke uh, one area more than once, but I would never do it more than a couple of times. And in general, I stroke off the body. So it can go either way. That just happens to be a demo of effleurage. Another technique that feels really good um, is called zigzag. And you can imagine a zigzag stroke goes like that. And you start with your fingers curved. So near your, your thumb is near your curved fingers and you're gonna open your fingers and then stroke up to close them, stroke down. And so you're moving across the body. And this is a pretty small dog. So, you know, it's a goat, but um, 
you know, it's small. So you can do this work on small to large dogs. So if you, you can, it's a lovely um, stroke to do with a horse, actually. You can go all way, way down and then come up. It's beautiful if you're standing on something. Um, so you open and close, making a zigzag pattern across the body. And when I'm teaching this, I like to encourage people to move their shoulder rather than just moving the, bending the elbow and moving the hands, but to really kind of get into it with your shoulder so that uh, it feels more flowy. <laughs> it just feels less, um, feels more connected, I'll say. Um, and you repeat this along the dog's body, slowing down, breathing, being mindful and observing your dog that they're comfortable. So here's a video of Cassie getting body work again. This is a demo of T-Touch body work with my dog, Cassie. I'm looking for some sign that Cassie would like to stay with me for this session. The hip shift gives me that sign. She could have gotten up and walked away. She, if she had made that choice, I would have given it to her. I'm doing some stroking down her body with my right hand. I'm thinking of melting my hand into her body rather than holding my hand stiffly, but I am using the flat of my hand, every surface of the palm of my hand. So that's very fingers. much Noah's March. I'm touch going to see if she's going to relax a bit more so that I can slow down my touch. I'm moving now so that I can do some zigzag touch. With the zigzag, I'm opening my fingers as I go back over her back and I'm closing my fingers into curved fingers as I bring them back towards my leg. So opening as I go over and closing and bringing my fingers together as I bring my hand back towards me. When I'm doing the Noah's March, I'm stroking in different parts of her body and then I'm ending the touch by going down her leg and off her paw or mm -hmm. down her body and off her tail. So I'm just slowly stroking. Now that she's getting very relaxed, I'm slowing down my touch, remembering to breathe. And with my left hand, I've just got it touching her so she's nice and grounded and can enjoy this session. She's doing a nice job of relaxing now. So that, um, that video demonstrates both the touches that the Noah's March and T-Touch could also be called effleurage. Um, and the zigzag touch. The benefits of the stroking touch is it enhances physical awareness. You're actually making contact with the entire body. Um, it integrates the front and back ends of the dog. Oftentimes we'll just pay attention to the front end. Very little is done with the back end. So you're, you're really um, connecting the entire dog. Uh, it's very helpful for aging dogs. Why is that? Um, uh, you're using your whole hand, your entire hand, and your hand is warm. So the more of your hand you use, the warmer that touch is, and it feels really, really good going over arthritic joints. If the strokes are done slowly, it calms the nervous system and therefore calms the dog. It's an easy one to do while out on walks. Let's just say you have your aging dog out on a walk and uh, they get very nervous about a siren or um, some noise that, that alarms them. You can do the stroking touch right where you are <laughs> and uh, help calm them down. And it's a good replacement for the padding that um, I've never really been a patter, but uh, you know, it's a nice replacement to use a bit of an intention versus padding, saying you're okay, <laughs> or quick petting. Not that anything's wrong with that. I've just never been one who pats. Thank you to Julie Allen for videotaping this session with her dog, Delight. Okay, I'm going to stop this for a second. So um, this was the person that I had, the foster dog, um, the person I was talking about that had the dog that uh, jumped up and bit my elbow first thing, this was the other dog. <laughs> this dog was so fearful, um, I couldn't even be on the same side of the room as this dog initially. And um, I, the way I started working with this dog is if this dog would look at me, 
I would toss a treat away from me. And then if D would look at me again, I would toss a treat away. And we just did that for a while. And then we went into um, movement work together. So he was able to do movement work, but it was probably two to three months of working with him every week before he walked up to me and basically pushed his body into my hands. And that was when we started doing body work together. We became extremely close. Um, so this is me demoing body work with, with who was before a very, very fearful dog. Standing demo of Noah's March and Zigzag. Here I start to use the back of my hand. If you start touch with the back of your hand, it's less threatening especially if the dog you're working with isn't used to your touch. It's a less invasive way of touching your dog. Now I'm doing Noah's March where I'm using a neutral wrist and I'm sort of melting my hand into Dee's body. I stroke down the body, down the leg, and notice that I'm not doing one area over and over and over. I'm moving to a different area with each stroke. I'm stopping it for a sec. I don't know if you guys are seeing it, but this dog, um, D, looks uncomfortable. He's not uncomfortable with me. As a matter of fact, he's moving more into my body. He's uncomfortable with the people. <laughs> there are three people in front of him, one with a camera on him. And um, so uh, I just wanted you to know you're going to see the body language. Of, he's done some lip licks, some flicks of the tongue. He's, his ear position shows he's not totally comfortable and his eyes are really wide. So I just wanted you to see. I'm breathing. I'm slowly stroking down his body and I'm keeping my wrist in neutral. Here I remove my hands in order to give the light the choice of walking away. He chooses to stay with me. Now I'm doing the zigzag touch. This is where one way in the stroke you're opening or spreading your fingers and the other direction you're bringing your fingers to a curved close. So I'm zigzagging down his body by opening my hand, opening my fingers, and then I'm, as I go up the body, I'm bringing my fingers to a close. Delight did a wonderful job standing for this session. Okay, and then finally, I want to show you circular touch, and that is um, where the fingers are slightly curved, and uh, they're making a little cir circle on the skin. The thing about this is you can use any part of your hand. You can use your knuckles, you can use the back of your hand, you can use your whole hand, you can use your pads of your fingers. The important part is not to have a finger sticking up, and, and yes? Greg, you just appeared. Did you want to tell me something? No, I was just doing a time check, Lori. So yeah. we have a few minutes left till the top of the hour. And um, okay. so I just wanted to make sure you were aware. Yeah, I was. I started speeding up my... <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Thanks. Thank so you. I like to do a circle plus a tad bit more. That is a T-touch circular stroke. Um, and you can do these anywhere the dog is comfortable. You do a circle and, and a little bit, and then you pause, move to the next part of the body and do a circle and a little bit. So um, here's a demo of that. So these are the circular touches. Okay, and then I went into some other touch. But like I said, you can use any part of your hand, but the more of your hand, the, you, the, warm, the warmer your hand is, sorry, the more of your hand you use, the warmer it is. All of a sudden I'm focusing on the time. Um, and the more of your hand you use, the more trust is required in general. 
Also, if you do very, very focused little circles in an area, that also requires uh, a lot of trust. And you can use the back of your hand for these circles. Benefits are as it can be soothing and calming. It feels different, gets the attention of the dog in a different way. It's not the same as padding. <clears throat> can ease soreness and release tension. Can be done on the face, jaw, tail, everywhere. And it can change a dog's expectations around touch. I'm going to skip this one. Um, I'm just demoing again, circular touch and some stroking. So I'm going to go ahead and skip that. It's two minutes long, <laughs> just too long for now. And I'm just going to, this one's three minutes long. So I'm just going to play it for about 15 seconds. So you see another example of how I might start a session. A little stroking and a little circular touch with my entire hand. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to skip that. And I'm going to go to slow movement. So whenever I do body work with the dog, I then move to doing slow movement with them so they can feel what their body feels like after movement. Kind of integrates the work. Um, so here, treats would be useful and working on a non-slip surface is super important. Even if you think it's not slippery to your dog, chances are it is. So being on a yoga mats or rubber floors or carpeting that isn't slippery is super important. Um, Benefits of slow movement, especially if you're using any sort of course, is that it improves focus and self-awareness. It can improve uh, the awareness of where the body is during movement or proprioception, calms the nervous system, and like I said, it integrates the body work. Here's a quick demo. This is a short video showing Cassie moving slowly through various equipment. We start with cones, and she's on two points of contact and the leash. I bring her slowly through the cones. I ask her to sit and then make a turn and take her back through. Now we're gonna do the ladder. This is hard for Cassie because she's used to trotting through the ladder as a warm up. And I'm asking her to really slow down, put a lot of focus to this. She can't really compensate which muscles she uses. She has to articulate very slowly through the ladder. Now I'm getting ready to show Cavaletti's in the balance disc. Cassie is going to start out by slowing down on the balance disc, front feet up and then back feet up. And then I'm going to ask her to move slowly through the Cavaletti's, stopping in between the poles. This is also difficult for her because she's used to trotting through Cavaletti poles. I'm using the balance disc as a little bit of a extra focus so she can go to something and do something with her feet and her balance and her proprioception and then come back through the poles nice and slowly with me stopping in between them she's doing a great job okay <laughs> and then you saw that when i was taking my dog through the combs i was using a harness um I was using a harness for the first part, but then when I was doing the slow moving through the cavalettis or through the poles and cones, I was um, not using, or rather the latter, I wasn't using anything and, and also with the cavalettis. Um, I do put every senior dog I've ever met, I've encouraged a harness over a collar because uh, at some point, um, the collar can push on the organs in the throat and also it affects breathing. If you wanna put your thumbs right at your throat here and put a little pressure, you'll know what that feels like. Harnesses can uh, do as much harm as a collar if they don't fit well and they're not used appropriately. Um, harnesses can also affect uh, in a negative way, posture, gait, musculoskeletal soundness, just like a collar can. I could tell you some stories, but I don't have time. <laughs> but anyway, so we look for harnesses to fit well. Um, we wanna keep them out of the uh, armpits or the 
uh, the elbows here, and we want to keep them from aiming forward into the pit. We also want to keep harnesses from blocking um, shoulder uh, extension and so um, and abduction. So we don't want anything across the shoulder. And we don't really want it in the throat either. So harnesses should allow freedom of movement and the loose leash, loose leash skills should be worked on separately from, um, from assuming a harness is gonna do that for you by hurting the dog, basically. You very much wanna work um, loose leash walking off any sort of equipment initially and then uh, working it inside with a leash um, and making sure you have a harness that fits your your dog well. Um, there's two harnesses I recommend. One's the Balance Harness by Blue9.com. I designed this harness just in full disclosure. And I designed it with aging dogs in mind because I kept having all these dogs in my practice and, um, and they were coming in in harnesses that fit crazy. And so this harness was designed so that you could adjust every single strap, including moving the thoracic, the strap that goes around over the ribs, you could move it up and down the body because both the straps that connect this are, are also adjustable. And so um, if a dog had a big lipoma, aging dog had a big lipoma or tumor there, then I could move the harness behind that still on the ribs, not behind the ribs. Um, so the balance harness uh, is useful for all life stages from puppy on. The other harness I recommend, I did not design, <laughs> is a help em up harness. And I've got the links there, blue-9.com and help em up .com. Um, This has two sections. So if you have a dog that basically can't get up the stairs, uh, you have two handles with the hind piece and the front piece, and you can lift them into a car or two of you can help get them up the stairs. So it's really useful for the older, older dogs that are lacking mobility and need to be lifted. And uh, here's some resources, uh, clickertrain.com, karenpryorclickertrain.com slash get in touch with your dog is an article on T-Touch bodywork technique. Harness Fit, if you go to my website, Seattle T Touch slash Harness Fit, um, I talk about it in detail there, blue9.com. Um, and uh, if you go to my website, you'll see future events. I do aging dogs um, courses. I have that course coming up on clickertrain.com in February 24. Uh, Kathy Sedeo and I did a DVD called Gift of a Gray Muzzle, G-R-A-Y active care for senior dogs. And that's on my site. I still have some left, um, but you have to be in the U.S. for me to ship it. And sorry, everybody, if you're not in the U.S. and you want to stream it, you can stream it from towserdog.com or Towser Dog Videos, T-A-W-Z-E-R, S-E-R, Z-E-R. I don't know, you'll see if you go to my website, seattlettouch.com. Okay, ready for questions. <laughs> Sped along right there. <laughs> Lori, thank you. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. I learned a ton and now I realize why my 20-year-old dog is rolling his eyes every time I touch him because I'm touching him in all the wrong ways. <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> but now I've, now I've learned what to start doing. So, um, But we do have a, a couple of questions in the queue and then um, so I'll read those to you and if you can respond and then I'll ask Laura if she's seeing anything on Facebook live. So um, the first question was, um, does rolling over on his back, and this is from Patty, she said, does rolling over on his back mean my dog is done? <laughs> Not necessarily. I will tell you when I got Cassie, every time I went up to her and she was lying down, she would roll on her back. And one of the videos that I stopped and didn't show you, she automatically rolls over. And I do this little kind of just a vibration technique on the outside of the thigh and she closes her legs and goes back on her side. So I was gonna show you that. Um, some dogs are just in the habit of doing that. It doesn't necessarily mean they're done. So you can just take your hands off and give them a little time. 
um, or very lightly encourage them to go back where in the position they were. And um, so your dog could be done or could not be done. It might just be a habit. It depends. Gotcha. I had another question come in and there are, it's two questions and I'm gonna try and piece it together here. Um, someone who took the T-Touch class from someone else and she said not to do a full 360 degrees full circle when you are doing the circular motion. So it sounds like the I question- I said it's circle plus. So it's 360 plus a, a some uh, sort of between three. So, so you think of a clock face, go six to six, but then go to eight or nine. It just feels different than an exact circle. If you go a circle and a little bit more. So I said that, but I said it quickly because um, of time. <laughs> Got you. Okay. And then Laura, I wanted to ask if, um, if you had anything on Facebook Live that I can, that we can ask Lori. Yeah, thanks for asking. I do not see any questions right now on the Facebook Live. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Lori, I just want to thank you for spending all this time with us today. It was it was so beneficial and so informative. And especially thanks for all the work you do to help us be better prepared to help our senior dogs live their absolute best lives. We truly appreciate that. And um I did want to mention too that a link to the recording of this session and any of the shared resources will be sent to those who registered today. So we're looking forward to sending that out to you. And then just to wrap up, I wanted to thank all of our participants. It was really, wow, what a, what a great group of participants. And I just wanted to share this because I was thrilled to see this, but not only did we have tons of folks join us today, but they came as far and wide as the United Kingdom, Stockholm, Sweden, um, from Seattle to New Hampshire, everywhere in between coast to coast, uh, north and south. And um, I just can't tell you how much we truly appreciate you spending this time with us. It means a lot to the gray muzzle. And um, if you like our vision and cause, mark your calendars for June 7th through 11th. We have our annual Senior Dogs Rock auction. It's a fundraising auction. And whether you help a sponsor or you donate some items for the auction or you come in as a bidder, we would love to have you participate. All of, all of the proceeds go to help senior dogs in need and they're the most vulnerable. So anything we can do to help them would be great. So thank you all again, Lori, thank you again. And um, I hope everybody has awesome. a awesome day. Take care. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. You.